Welcome to Civilian Carry Radio, proud member of the Firearms Radio Network. This show is brought to you by our sponsors tonight, Big Tex Outdoors and FPF Training. Big Tex Outdoors' main fo- focus is high quality t- tactical CD EDC gear. They offer 100% free risk shopping. That means if you change your mind for any reason, they'll refund the full purchase price, the shipping costs, and pay for return shipping. So there's total free shipping shopping. On top of that, most of their orders ship for 24 hours or less. Some of their items ship for as little as $1.99. They're an FFL Class 3 SOC, and they sell suppressors and NFA other items. Check out their website, Big Techs Outdoors. Use the code CC Radio for 15% discount at checkout. And remember, folks, risk free shopping. FPF training is for citizens seeking to become capable self defenders who require that their mindset be reinforced and the knowledge to inform decisions and skills necessary to undertake decisive action while under stress. To fulfill this requirement, our sponsor FPF training offers concealed and carried advanced skills and tactics, consisting of extensive coursework, practical application, and a range time that is focused on a host of skills designed to enable ordinary people to prepare themselves for an armed lifestyle and criminal violence. FPF training is based in Virginia and is traveling to select ranges around the country. To attend a course or to host a class, Go to fpftraining.com. And folks, please stay tuned after the end of this live t- live broadcast for a feature from our sponsor, FPF Training, and it's entitled Advanced Skills and Tactics. Folks, our goal and the focus of this podcast is to spread the message to every people, the importance of the Second Amendment, firearm safety, education, training, and mindset. Remember, you and only you are responsible for the safety and protection of yourself and your loved ones. Our mission statement, gun ownership is your right, safety and education are your responsibility. I'm your host and producer, Baraka James, along with our awesome guest, our normal (laughs) co-host, Alan Sams. Good evening, Alan. How are you? What's up? Stop biting your lip because I'm still jacked up on the thing to say, oh, you bastard. I feel feel your stress over there. Folks, Tatiana is out uh, out in California. Uh, She is teaching this week, so... She is our normal, but she's off. So just so you guys know, um, our two guest co-hosts this evening, first as a normal staple is uh, Lee Williams, uh, LEO, Chief Deputy and owner of First Person Safety. Good evening, Lee. How are you? Good evening, sir. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm still getting over the pregnancy, but I'm trying to make it. And we have returning Mr. Keel Kadir. He is also a veteran LEO um, and f- founder and lead instructor at Citizen Safety Academy. Good evening, Lee. All right, Keel. Glad cool. to have you back. <laughs> What's up, Pete? Thanks, All right. I'm struggling, but I'm getting there. Uh, we, are, uh, we are listener funded radio. You, the listeners and lures, uh, this program possible. You can contribute to the show via P- Patreon for as little as a dollar per episode, as much as you like, by going to www.patreon forward slash CC radio or clicking the link here in our show notes. A huge shout out to our $10 per show Patreon pledges, Mark B, Young Pei Chang, our $5 per show P- Patreon pledges, Christopher D. Rob J, CJ, James W, Russ A, Ira S, Rob C, Michael G, Eric B, Mark E, ATI Guns, Pat B, John W, Onsite Firearms Training, and Scott D. We want to say a huge thank you to all the people who currently pledge through Patreon. Your support helps contribute to our goal of educating people on the importance of the segment of firearms education, mindset, and safety. Folks, the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and guests and do not reflect the official policy or position of the firearms radio, civilian carry radio, and or their employees. Viewer discretion is advised, especially on live shows. Folks, tonight we are welcome Mr. John Hearn, LEO of Range Master, who first appeared on our 55th episode way back on May 16th of 2018. We have the link to the previous one there. Uh, John's bio, John has been a federal law enforcement officer since 1992, serving primary in, as in uniform p- patrol. He currently serves in a, as an instructor, firearms tactic, active shooter, and use of force on force, an armorer, and field training officer for his agency. John's firearms instructor um, certifications include federal law enforcement, Fletzy, pistol, revolver, shotgun, rifle, select fire, federal bureau of, federal bureau of FBI, um, po- police firearms instructor, national Re- uh, National Rifle Association Tactical Shooting, Range Master Advanced Instructor Certification. John has been a Range Master Instructor since 2001 and has helped teach armed citizens, law enforcement, and military across the country. He is also a noted researcher and speaker and has 
been speaking at a variety of national and international ven venues since 2005. His bio is here in our link, and we welcome you back, John, and I pass it off to Alan. Okay, like uh, like Deco B statement. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming out again. I appreciate it, man. Glad to be back. So uh, I know you're a research guy and 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 you're you're an information guy, and uh, you've spent uh, you spent some time researching um, performance under stress. Um, so how does um, training, well, proper training and practice. Uh, affect the outcome of a uh, a violent encounter, um, and in most instances, are people rising to the occasion, or um, you know what's going on there? And is executing high performance in a stressful situation possible? And what's the recipe to the success in that? All right, counselor, I object to the compound question. Could we keep? <laughs> <laughs> We'll break it down. <laughs> All right. So uh, performance under stress. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people, when you analyze these subjects, is we have to accept the fact that not all encounters are the same, especially as far as complexity goes. If we delve into the research, this is some of this worthless information that Lee makes fun of me for. They actually have a way to compute this thing called task complexity. And it's a scale that runs from about zero to 54. There's a bunch of uh, numbers you can put on values. But what we find when it comes down to it is that not all situations are the same. If you're a uniform law enforcement officer responding to a large active shooter event, like a Mumbai kind of a thing, you're trying to drive through traffic, run code, grab a patrol rifle, communicate with the other first responders, move into that environment. That's a very chaotic, demanding, stressful place that only the best performers are going to function well in. Um, if you change that in, you know, to a more typical scenario for the armed citizen, you and your wife are uh, walking across the parking lot when Mookie and Ray Ray step out from behind the van, start to produce handguns and demand what you've got. Well, that's a much simpler situation to figure out, to, to, to stamelessly steal from Tom here. You know, you can figure that one out really quick. OK, my wife's here. I don't need to shoot her. Right. I don't need to shoot myself. I just need to deal with those two guys out there. So the first thing you have to appreciate is how complex the sex situation is. And it's kind of a balancing act. If you're in a really simple situation and you have some very basic skills, then you can probably pull yourself out of that. On the other hand, if you find yourself in a very complex situation and you can't bring enough skill and emotional control to the game, then you're really going to lose badly. And the way I like to visualize that, if you guys can kind of imagine a seesaw on one side, the left side, let's say we've got the task complex to the situation we're facing. And what we have to do is we have to put more weight on that scale and tip it into our favor. And the big parts of that, the stuff that we're going to bring to, to balance that out are going to be our skills, our level of emotional control, uh, to a lesser degree, our physical fitness, and finally, almost infinitesimally, our gear. Of the four things that we can really deal with, probably emotional control is more important than any of those things. But it's a weird thing. If you have a, a, a moderately complex situation, and let's say you have a lot of skill and not much emotional control, sometimes that's enough. The classic example would be... Uh, you just quickly present your gun, you burn the dude down, and about uh, five seconds later, your, your knees start to cross each other and you pee yourself and all this other kind of stuff. Well, for the situation you faced, you had enough on that day. Uh, so my take is, is I want as much stuff on that far right side that I can bring to the fight because if I can, you know, if I've got a five pound problem and I can drop 50 pounds of solution on it, then I'm going to win that fight. If I reverse that and I've got a 50 pound problem and I've only got about five pounds of uh, emotional control, skill, maybe some physical conditioning, then, I, then I'm in deep doo-doo. Um, that's just the, the way we can break that down really, really quickly. And we, uh, the training is going to um, kind of come in two ways. So all these things are interrelated. When I, when I draw this out, and if, if you ever listen to me drone through my eight-hour presentation, it's a Venn diagram where they overlap because your emotional control can be helped by your training, and training can be helped by emotional control. So the training can be a big part of helping you remain cool and calm and collected because when your body's facing sudden death, if it's got a plan tucked in somewhere back along the head, then it's going to be a lot more likely to, to try to stay in that rational mind and deliver something that's, uh, that's worthwhile. You'll actually be able to deliver that skill and hopefully be able to change the outcome of the fight. And so that's where training really comes in. It's a twofold thing. Number one, we need the skill, but it also is going to help bolster our mindset 
and uh, help us keep everything together as well. Awesome. Um, so as far as, um, as far as executing, uh, at a, at, at, in high performance, you know, under those stressful situations, um, is, is people's perception of what's possible? Is that more of a, a, a training thing, I guess? Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you've never been exposed to some of the, the, the skill, the level of skill that some of these, some, some people are performing at, a lot of times people don't think that it's possible or think it's a parlor trick or something like that. Um, is, is the acknowledgement of the possibility of those skills, is that important or is that just a non-factor? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what we're confronting here is just something that uh, it's a delicate subject. And of course, I don't be delicate well, but there are several works that have been written out there that have a lot of weight in this area and they're, they're older works. You know, I, I'll, I'll talk about sharpening the warrior's edge, right? That book was originally published in 1995. That's before, you know, online publishing or on demand publishing. So he probably had to stop researching that book around 93, write the book 94. So you're looking at some really, really stale information. Uh, if you were to look at a map of the world that had been drawn in 1492, it would look different than a map of the world that had been drawn <laughs> in 1495. So uh, a lot of the problems we have as far as people having very low expectations of their performance come with this failure to keep updated on the best research. Uh, there's some, if nobody ever did this stuff well, then yeah, we could just simply dismiss it as this stuff is impossible. But when we go out there and we look, we see guys that have been able to pull off some incredible feats of skill. And I'm not just talking about gunfighting, but for instance, uh, one of the closest analogs to this stuff would be flying. If you look at what Sully Sullenberger did, getting that jet down on the Hudson when he did, that was an amazing level of skill that he bought there. And if you read his biography, he had the mindset. I mean, he was a former Air Force combat pilot, but he also had a, a, a large amount of skill that he'd been developing his whole, whole life. So you've got to keep the... the your expectations updated as far as the research goes, because clearly some guys can do that. You know, I can point to various examples, you know, everybody wants to make fun of the cops because of, you know, that, you know, depending on who you talk to, maybe a 15 to 20% hit rate, but that mm -hmm. doesn't apply to all cops. You can find pockets of really skilled law enforcement that, that deliver in the field under life and death stress all the time. But when we look at all those people, they, they all have the same factors in common. They really do. So uh, as far as, you know, being possible. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it involves this horrible four-letter word. I know I'm not supposed to cuss, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. To ease everybody's pain, I'll just spell it out so I don't say it. But it's spelled W-O-R-K. And especially in the 21st century, people scream and run um, away from that word. But you What know, website can I buy that at? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got a coupon code? <laughs> but if, if, if you do the work, you'd be amazed what you can do when the chips are down. Yeah. Well, John, um, I uh, you mentioned Siddle, which I believe is uh, Sharpton the Warriors. Is that Siddle's book? Siddle's book, correct? I didn't mention an author's name for the record. You did. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, okay. Well, I got a question <laughs> from Tom. Tom Givens. <laughs> he said, "Um, so, could you talk about Siddle's book? Because I don't know if a lot of people know about it. But uh, and since Siddle's books have been discredited, what books do you recommend on the mental aspects of self defense?" All right. So Siddle's central problem was is number one. Um, we had to figure out what kind of training resources we're going to put in. So I think Siddle was really, really pessimistic um, about what you could do with the amount of training that kind of typical law enforcement get. I mean, we, we think about somebody that is going to get in a knockdown, drag out fight with somebody. Well, let's suppose this guy hasn't been fighting his whole life and he went through the academy. Well, how much empty hand stuff do you get? Well, you maybe get a 40 hour block, but if it's been five years since you had that block, he just does not have much skill to deliver. So none of those locks, none of those holes, none of those pressure points, he's not going to be able to execute that under stress. So I think, you know, to be fair to Siddle, part of it was he just assumed that, you know, what can you do with basically, you know, zero to minimal resource investment. But uh, one of the, the central tenets that the reason, main reasons Siddle is flawed is that he says that everything performance wise is tied to heart rate. And if we go back in our history, there's this uh, the Yerkes Dodson inverted U principle that goes back to the early 20th century. Uh, like 1900s, like around you know 
1908 ish kind of a thing. And the whole idea was that as you know, the stress increases, your performance decreases. But what we found in subsequent research is that's not necessarily the case. And previous researchers, earlier researchers, had tied all that stuff to heart rate. They would basically sit there and go, hey, if your heart rate hits this magic number, you can't do these things. I mean, that's enshrined in the Grossman book. In the, the Grossman books, there's that chart where it says, you know, above 180, degree, uh, 180 beats per minute, you lose all fine motor control. You can't focus, which is pretty amazing because there was a uh, there's video of Ron Avery out there on a treadmill, you know, clocking almost 200 beats per minute and clearly able to perform well. So the, one of the principal flaws with Siddle was an over-reliance on old outdated research tied to heart rate. Um, I love talking about this one. So you, you asked, so I'm telling you, uh, I love <laughs> research that actually is done for our world. So classically research is done, you know, if, if we want to know are cops racist in the decisions to shoot and not shoot people. Well, a lot of researchers will go out there and they'll test college students to see if cops are biased. And the initial round of training, for instance, that did that said that, hey, you know, these college students have a bias in who they shoot and don't shoot. So cops must. Well, interesting enough, when we replicate that same research with cops, we actually find that effect goes away with training. So similarly with heart rate, uh, there's been all this heart rate out there, but there was this great researcher by the name of Kathy Vonk, and she had this crazy idea. She's like, let's put high quality heart rate monitors on people in the field. OK, I mean, like actually out doing the job. And she also did some stuff with people in the academy. So because she was using a very high quality heart rate monitor, something that sampled the heart rate uh, at least once a second, if not faster than that, she got people involved in knockdown drag out fights, foot pursuits, vehicle pursuits. I don't know if she ever actually got a live shooting or not, but she certainly got a lot of confrontations. And what she found was that heart rate was only very, very vaguely associated with performance. What she found was that a lot of times people would go up to a very high heart rate, but they were still able to get the job done. Maybe the handcuffing job was a little bit uglier. Maybe, you know, God forbid, don't tell the DT instructor that the keyholes for the cuffs weren't pointed the right way, but they were actually able to perform. And she couldn't find any evidence that fine motor control was going out the door just because the heart rates went up. Now, interestingly enough, and in, in kind of a sad commentary, the other thing she found is that she found people who just seemed fundamentally unsuitable to be in law enforcement. We're talking about people that couldn't perform and broke down uh, in academy scenarios. And, you know, I would offer if you can't manage to keep it together and perform in an academy scenario, you're probably not really cut to be out on the street to make those same decisions. So, again, we that heart rate myth, that heart rate is destiny. Uh, I can debunk that thing three ways from Sunday. And again, one of my frustrations is she did that work in the early 2000s. So it's not like it's this, you know, great paper that was just published yesterday. We've known this for a long time, but we haven't updated the way we think about performance under stress. And we still, you know, we reference Siddle and Grossman as far as what's possible. Now, I think the final uh, question, part of that question, because you guys just love to hammer me with the compound <laughs> questions, was uh, <laughs> whose books do I recommend, right? So right. Um, shameless plug, uh, Masada, you've asked me to write a chapter for his book. Um, just ignore the flattering things he says about me because uh, Lee and Akia will tell you, not, will assure you that none of those are true. <laughs> but I had to condense my talk down to about 5,000 words. So that book has, besides my chapter, has a ton of good, useful information. Nobody talks about guns or ammunition or, you know, shooting stance anywhere in there. It's a lot of solid information that you need. Uh, and that 5,000 words is a pretty good summary of my research. Uh, the other source that's out there that's pretty good. Um, hey, how's this for props? Uh, training at the Stupid Life by Ken mm -hmm. Murray. That's a book on conducting force on force training. But the first 97 pages of it or so are just a very, very good detailed breakdown of a lot of the topics I've been suggesting. Now, he relies heavily on Grossman and repeats the mythology about people having this, you know, inherent um, innate hesitation to kill people. But if you just kind of read him and ignore the Grossman and the civil stuff, you, you find a lot of good information there. So short of me writing a book, uh, I can't think of anything else that I would really steer you to. Those are probably the two best written sources uh, that are out there. Or you can always try to catch one of my talks at the tech cons. Awesome. All right, John, I've got a very, very hard question for you. And uh, you're going to recognize it because it's a question that you've asked me to ask uh, previous guests. What do you think is good enough? So the first part of that question is good enough for what? Because, again, you know, what kind of uh, scenario are we confronting? You know, if 
you're a member of a high-end SWAT team tasked with doing hostage rescue, then I'm going to hold you to a, a much higher standard than I would the armed citizen. Um, I would encourage people to kind of work towards some goals. So for the armed citizen running around, if I were just to throw out some good enoughs, if you can't get the gun out of however you're carrying it, I don't care how you carry the gun. If you want to off-body carry it, I don't care. If you want to carry, you know, any of these, <coughs> excuse me, other suboptimal methods, I don't care. But you need to be able to get the gun out and get a meaningful hit on somebody in at least two seconds. If, you, if it takes more than two seconds to happen, it's never going to happen in the real world. Now, is that good enough? Absolutely not. I would like to see people start to chip away at that. Um, so, for instance, let's take that, you know, let's call a good hit uh, eight inches high in the chest. Probably a little optimistic, but we'll take it to start with. So let's take that time down after I've got two seconds. Let's knock it down to 1.7 from concealment. And somewhere around the time I'm maybe getting around 1.5. I mean, if you can consistently produce that, you're doing pretty good on that concealed carry. At that point, I'm far more inclined to start to shrink the target, right, and keep the time about the same, but I'm always working to improve. So I'm almost tricking you in that process, though, because what people don't appreciate is it takes a lot of repetitions to be able to deliver this stuff under stress. So speaking as a tactical issue, being able to get the gun out and deliver a fight stopping hit in, you know, a blazing time, one second, 1.25. That's impressive. You can, it's a cool range trick. Uh, if we look at the stuff that our friend John Correa has done, that's not always going to determine the fight. But the secret is because I have made you do the number of repetitions it's going to take, to get to those skill levels, right? You will have made the changes to your, the physical changes to your mind that you're gonna need to be able to deliver that stuff under stress. So, uh, you know, especially for the armed citizen, have a gun, be able to get it out in a reasonable time frame. certainly no more than two seconds, ideally a little bit short, um, get a meaningful hit on a person. Again, start out with an eight inch circle high in the chest. Uh, my favorite target, I don't have a prop right now, but if you'll simply, take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, fold it so that it's about, what is that? Eight and a half by five and a half. That vertical orientation of that particular target, I really like because that's where the vital stuff is in a human being. If you can hit that, you know, 1.5 seconds or so, especially again from your concealment, especially when you're cold, uh, we're starting to get into the area where I, I consider you good enough, at least as far as, say, for instance, that skill. Okay. Well, before we move uh, away from the book topic, uh, some guy that you may know, Named uh, John Murphy. Never Have you ever heard of him? Uh, I know of Mr. Murphy, but I was not aware that he could read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he wants to know if you uh, extract any lessons that are applicable to citizens from Michael Spick's work, The Ace Factor. Oh, yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, I'm John Hearn and I'm a nerd. Right. And my my nerd, my nerddom actually spans kingdoms. So like I've got a bit of an aviation nerd streak in me. And I actually found that book. It was when I was uh, reading Ken Murray's stuff. He referenced that book. And uh, first off, it's out of print. So it's kind of hard to get a hold of. But it was the first book to really talk about the value of simulation training. They started looking at, you know, the reason that the Navy has the, um, the big games they do now, the red flag exercises, the whole Top Gun school was they saw from understanding aerial combat that the number kind of fluctuates, maybe three. So if I can get you somewhere between three to five fights under your belt, you're gonna, your chances of long-term survival go up hugely. Because what happens is, as in you know, dog fights, as in the real world, there's a tremendous amount of information. And it's not that you learn to fly better, but what they think happened was that you learned what information was important and that which you could ignore. And as soon as you, you could have that filter in place, then all of a sudden you were much more efficient and could perform a lot better. And, you know, the, the, the ACE factor has some nice talks about uh, mental conditioning as well. And one of the things they talk about is if you can launch a good, solid surprise attack on someone, that's a really good way to dominate a fight, which is realistically what the armed citizen is going to do. You know, you're going to be confronted by the guy in the parking lot. He's thinking he's going to have a robbery. You know, you're going to have a shooting, right? The guy that initiates a shooting is always going to do better than the guy that thinks he's there to pick up a paycheck. Cool. I guess we will start with um, a question from Tim Reedy before I get to my question. Um, Tim of uh, TDR training. Um, he wants to know who is the funniest man in firearms training these days. Oh, well, that would be Tim, by God, the man of a million jokes. 
and more than seventy <laughs> pairs of legs, that we, which he freely displays. Because <laughs> he's a I, real man. I, I do have to interject here and say that you know when we, when we had Tim on the show, there was a question as to who was the nicest guy in the firearms training business, and it came down to a a battle between Tim and and the magnificent Steve Avey, and I gotta say, Steve just pulled off one that uh, uh, he 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 put Tim in the barrel there. Uh, Tim Tim's fallen way behind. Um, if I may have just a second to tell the story, yes, yeah, Steve, story. my uh, you know my training company came up with a signature drill because I think that's mandatory in the training business these days. <laughs> and uh, Steve was one of the first people to win. A patch on, on the drill and a mutual friend of ours and her husband uh, participated in the 75th reenactment of D-Day. Uh, they went over and on the night of June 5th uh, this year uh, suited up, got into an actual plane that flew into Normandy on D-Day. They fly over at the same time that everybody goes in and, the, and they parachute in and uh, Steve had her take the patch that he had been awarded and she jumped into Normandy with that on the 75th anniversary. And they put that uh, together with a commemorative patch from that event and put it in a plaque and presented it back to me. So Tim, uh, you, you got your work cut out for you, bud, if you're going to catch up. <laughs> well, no, and I would, I would never, I mean, Tim's funny, but if you get to know Tim, he's really not that nice. <laughs> 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 so uh john you kind of touched on uh touched on it before answering another question but uh i'd like you to speak a little bit on your um your who wins who loses and why presentation and, and kind of how that sets um the, your priorities of training and kind of juxtapose those priorities and training with what people wish it was or maybe thinks it is and well, why maybe it's just that four letter word you were talking about but <laughs> i don't want to answer that question because i hope to make a a, a small fortune in the training business and I, I know two of my co-hosts certainly do but uh, <laughs> i guess your point kind of in that is that a lot of the priorities that we really need to have <clears throat> excuse me don't match out with what we're doing you know one of the classic conundrums in the, the training business is giving people what they want versus what they need so let's talk about what people actually need the first thing we need to do when it comes to this whole exercise is uh, the, the, the fancy word for it is novelty, right? We need to eliminate the novelty of violent situations. If, for instance, the first time you are walking across that parking lot, and I, I'm sorry for the continual parking lot references, but that's where violent crime actually happens. If the first time you've ever considered that encounter is when it happens, your mind's going to have to really, really struggle to get, it, get its head around it because it's never seen that situation before. It doesn't know what to do with it. And by default, your brain thinks anything that's new and unexplained and we don't have any category for it is bad. So one of the first things we have to do is um, acquaint ourselves with violence. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, you know, you can obviously go out and get in a bunch of gunfights, get in a bunch of fist fights, go bounce at some nasty seedy bars. Uh, but there's probably an easier, better way to do that. Uh, if you just simply watch uh, enough videos of uh, violent events, they tend to, you know, have the same pattern, you know, you can start to identify it. Um, you should accept the fact that if you have to defend your life with, you know, a firearm, there's a good chance someone will get, get hurt or died. So watching those events unfold in front of you and kind of creating a parking space in your mind for the violence you may face and the violence you may have to do to others <coughs> would absolutely be the, uh, the first step in that process. So that would be the first thing we need to do is remove novelty. The second thing we need to do is to start to build mental maps for the situations we're going to face. Uh, again, you know, the, the classic analogy is it's kind of like a, uh, kind of dating myself here, but like we all used to have these little three bo plastic boxes that held three by five cards. And if we needed like a recipe, we'd flip through it before we all got ruined by technology, right? Well, your mind kind of does work that way. We have a bunch of three by five cards that are potential solutions to problems and we walk around with them. What we need to do is to start putting as many solutions into those into that box so that we'll have them when we need it. Right. So we need to start developing mental maps, what we're actually going to have to do uh, in an actual confrontation. So, you know, an example of that is uh, uh, is hitting uh, a human silhouette at a thousand yards, an impressive feat of marksmanship. Yep, it is. It's a pretty neat skill. 
Uh, it's what I wish I'd done, but it doesn't really mu have much to do with the parking lot confrontation. So maybe I want to start to build some maps that uh, build around that, you know, uh, the Givens uh, suggestion of just reading the local paper and seeing what crimes are occurring. Maybe, you know, an ATM, think about the places you are, you know, if you go to the same businesses every day, if you own a business, where are my points of cover, you know, and it, even probably arguably more important than cover is where's the nearest exit? Because uh, in this day and age with the way that uh, the media tends to treat people, uh, probably the best thing you can do when a violent confrontation is brewing is simply leave. You know, it's uh, the, kind of the, the sad world that we have been uh, forced into by the people that are unwilling to accept the sad necessity of violence. So, again, creating those maps are going to be really, really important. So that's step one and step two, right? It's only when we get to step three that we start talking about building motor programs. And that's what most training is, is that most training is um, the development of motor programs in a way that is most economically beneficial to the firearms instructor. Did I say that out loud? Apparently <laughs> <laughs> I did, uh, right? But, you know, there's only, you know, standing on the square range and shooting and stuff like that. Those are all important motor skills, you know, getting the gun out, reloads, fixing it and stuff like that. It's important to have those motor skills developed, but realistically, if you don't have the first two things, the motor skills are never gonna come into play in all likelihood. So if you, if, you, if you haven't wrapped yourself or your head around the idea of having to do violence to others, having violence done into you, um, you're never going to think to draw your pistol. If you've always thought that, you know, uh, your fight would be preceded by a loud beep from an electronic timer, then the skills you develop won't be much good, right? So again, the skills, most of the stuff that we do in training, <coughs> excuse me, is, is kind of third in that order. Now, I would point out that, you know, not all training is, you know, that utterly deficient like that. Um, Tom, if you take combative pistol one, uh, that class is less about shooting, but more about getting your head straight. Uh, other people that will help you get your head straight. Uh, John Farnham is famous for that. Uh, Craig Douglas, South Narc. Those are people that can get into your head and start to get you thinking about it. You know, uh, I think he still sells it. But one of the best values out there in the training business is uh, Tom has his take on Cooper's color codes. And dude, that's like, you know, I'm not sure what he charges for that, but that's a, a really quick lecture to help you start to, to build those mental maps that you need. So only then, you know, because realistically, until we know what situations we're going to face, we don't know what skills to develop. Going back to that thousand yard rifle shot example, you know, um, I, I would offer that, you know, if you can get the gun out and I would say I like to uh, train to fire failure drills, because if I can perform that complex skill, you know, if I fire you know two to three rounds to a high chest and immediately transition to the head. In the real world, if that's what I've trained myself to do, if the headshot's there, I'll be able to take it. Obviously, if I track my sights up and the head isn't there anymore, then I can abort that program and not need it. On the other hand, what a lot of people try to do, which is, you know, I'll fire a couple of rounds to the body, and then if he's still there, I'll, I'll shoot to the head. Uh, you put people under a little bit of stress, and they never, ever do that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in the uh, National Tactical Invitational for three years, and that was one of the most common things they said is people that said, you know, They'd give the school answer of, I'll just fire a failure drill. But the amount of people that would actually deliver the failure drill uh, when they were placed into a scenario under some modicum of stress was almost zero. So, again, that's just one of the things that I think is important is zero to 10 yards is I want to train myself as kind of a, a default response to try to work that failure drill. To me, that's a relevant motor skill. Um, and again, you know, basically from the ready and from the holster and just being able to keep the gun running in some shape, form or fashion. Uh, that's most of what everybody needs. So again, that's number three is where training really starts to kick in. Finally, number four, the last thing that we really have to do as far as priorities is we need to keep all that, that stuff we just discussed updated because people don't appreciate how rapidly motor programs deteriorate. So, you know, when you're at the range and you fire your last beautiful, perfect shot, and you put the gun in the holster for the last time that day, the stopwatch starts and that those motor skills that you've been working to develop start to get stale. And if you let them go long enough, they're going to, you're not going to be able to deliver much of anything. The only good thing is, is that if you have a decent level of skill and you lay off, it'll be easier to return back to that old level of skill. But the level of performance that we need to have to, to deliver under life and death stress is going to require some degree of ongoing training to keep those motor programs fresh. And not just that, but, you know, thinking about our making sure that we're, we're ready for a fight, uh, the novelty of the situation, making sure that doesn't creep up on us and continuing to build valid mental maps. All of those things are what really matter. 
So, you know, the, the, the cool stuff is really number three on our list of priorities. And realistically, if you know, for instance, if you know yourself really well, for instance, and you know you really don't think you could ever shoot somebody, but you accept the fact that violence exists and you need to be able to deal with it, right? And you build me mental maps, right? Such as when things start to go south, I'm just going to leave immediately. Then we never get to skill, you know, we never get to that third level, which may, we should, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of uh, felt firsthand this year about the, like you were talking about, kind of the degradation of skill. Um, and and I, I didn't even, I didn't realize until this week and how, how much it affects you, you know, um, this has been a, a, a crazy, crazy, crazy year for me. And my, the extent of my shooting this year has been an IDPA match a month. And going from, you know, 1,500 rounds a month for the last I don't know how long, um, it's when you when you go up to do something, before, I, I always knew that, it, you know, from zero to 25 yards, it was a given, you know what I mean? And then I go up and uh, do a relatively simple drill and just don't even try to go fast, and then the confidence isn't there, let alone the the actual the physical aspect of it. It it really it, it's a it's an eye opener, and, and it makes me want to get back out there and, and, and make the time to work again. So absolutely, and I'd point out that uh, you can't get everything through dry work, right? Or dry practice, but you can get a lot of it. I mean, you can get ninety percent of it. So realistically, um, kind of as a minimal level. If you'll just you know do your dry work twice a week, it's never been more than three and a half days since you last touched the gun. If you mm -hmm. can make it to the range, I mean, I'm not saying it's optimistic, but if you can make it to the range once a month, and you know, not don't just you know sling some lead down there, but maybe do some structured drills. I know this is a crazy idea, but maybe we have some tests that I shoot again and again, so I have some metrics. So if I go to the range and I perform cold on a drill that I've happened to like, I know where my skills are. Or if on the other hand. I can't deliver that base of cold performance, which is that's really all you're ever going to have. Then, yeah, maybe I need to do a little bit more work. But um, it's only been fairly recently that people have really, really started to appreciate the, uh, the you know, the uh, the work that can be done with dry practice. Uh, to bunny trail really quickly, I think that we as Americans have suffered from almost an ammo glut. We think that we can get ourselves better by shooting and shooting by itself doesn't always solve these problems. There's some things that you can only learn in dry practice, right? So for instance, uh, being able to call your shot, or looking for dips and dives in the muzzle. If I, if I bring the gun up and right at the last distance, I'm diving it down, a lot of times the recoil of the gun will hide that from me. Well, if I'm doing the, if there's no rounds in the gun, I can watch that dive happen and I can start to work on my trigger presses to correct that. Um, you know, the, the classic story about that was when, was when Rhodesia still existed as a country, uh, they were under a strict arms embargo. And the Rhodesian National Ipsic team was, you know, literally they were winning world championships and placing very highly at the Ipsic Nationals, you know, with the whole team, maybe getting to split 50 rounds a month. But they were doing a, a, a buttload of dry work to make that happen. So, yeah, the, the laying off really stinks. Um, but again, just, you know, that's where I kind of am right now is that uh, I'm fortunate enough I get to do dry work at work. And I just make it a point when I'm in the office, ideally first thing in the morning, so it happens. Just 10, 15 minutes, get the gun out, get it on target, work some, uh, you know, dry trigger presses for groups, um, just all those basic skills I need to develop. And I can keep a pretty good, you know, uh, edge, you know, uh, not trying to brag, but, you know, this year at TACCON, I think I made it to the, the final eight. And that was, you know, after a whole bunch of family drama, pre, you know, babies, all this other kind of stuff going on. Uh, and I've found that I can pretty consistently, if I, uh, yeah, uh, you know, dry practice every day leading up to events. I can I can get about ninety percent of the, the work there uh, that I need to deliver. Um, just throwing it out real quickly, Annette Evans has a great book called I think it's the the dry the dry fire primer, the dry practice primer, something like that. Uh, it's probably a really good entry point if you haven't done a whole lot of that. It, it's a really good entry work uh, entry point into that whole world there. But there's a ton of value that can be done in that. Awesome. Hey, John. Um, I, earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, a course by uh, one of Tom's courses. I think you mentioned two of them. And uh, this question got sent to me by Lynn, Lynn Gibbons. And she says, uh, what do you consider to require courses for a well-rounded 
armed citizens? I mean, what courses do you think a well-rounded armed, a well -rounded armed citizen should consider taking now? So that's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And I'm not trying to weasel here, but I think that a lot of that has to do with you know, that Dr. Williams' April idea of knowing yourself. You know, if you're a high responder and when the stuff starts to go bad, you're going to stand and fight. You need to know yourself well enough to know that. But that also means that you're going to have to be able to deliver when it comes time to stand and fight. As to opposed to the person, you know, I, the way I think about it is that the gun, the pistol I wear every day, it's just simply emergency life-saving equipment, right? And people have different attitudes with that. For some people, the uh, pistol is only a life ring, right? I can only save one person with it. It's probably going to be myself. And I can't, you know, I'm going to limit what I try to do based on that. For the other people, especially the people that, number one, have the mindset and number two, have the skill, that pistol becomes a lifeboat, okay? You can use it to protect and save yourself. You can use it to protect, save and protect others. So a big part of figuring out what training you need is just kind of what person you're going to be when the chips are really down. And that requires a lot of honest introspection. So uh, kind of how that breaks out would kind of depend on where you go. Um, obviously, I think that uh, I just feel like I'm a horrible name dropper here. But Dr. Sherman House has uh, his idea of the civilian defender and he has a, a matrix of stuff you need to work on, you know, really mundane stuff simply you know if you look at the risk factors of being involved in an accident versus being a homicide victim unless you're living in certain you know census blocks you probably need to take a defensive driving course before you need to take a pistol course but if i were to kind of break it down uh let me think what have i gotten the most out of it? so i think everybody needs a basic pistol class right so examples of pistol a basic pistol class would be something like tom's combative pistol one uh, there's some other good classes that kind of fulfill that same niche. Randy Kane's Handgun 101. Um, those are good two, three day classes that will give you a basic set of skills. Now, if you have a little bit of money to play with and stuff like that, uh, it's much better from a learning perspective to kind of do more of a deep dive. So if you certainly have the, the funds to go to like a fixed, a nice fixed training school that has a really solid infrastructure, then I will start to look there. You know, it, it's kind of hard to be a 250 at gun site. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, they're gonna teach you the skills with the gun, right? But they're also gonna put you in simulators. They're gonna to talk to you about mindset. They're gonna have you do stressful exercises. They're gonna expose you to stress through man on man shooting competitions and stuff like that. So if you can take you know, the, the, the five weeks out and pay the tuition, get out to Arizona, or you know, for instance, Thunder Ranch would be another example, then those are really, really worth it. So, cause realistically, you know, we've got to have those handgun skills. Um, other stuff that's worthwhile um, is we have to accept the fact that the vast majority of assaults aren't going to justify the use of a deadly weapon. You know, I think the number I see kicked around is that only about 20 percent of assaults that occur in this country are aggravated assaults. Right. That leaves a huge gaping chasm of about 80 percent. So I think if you're going to be serious about this stuff, you need to be able to fill in that 80 percent somewhere. How you fill that in is kind of, again, kind of depending on how you're wired. Uh, if you're comfortable with empty hands and stuff like that. Uh, something like Craig Douglas's uh, ECQC would be a really good way to do that. Something as simple as, you know, taking a couple of years of uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu so you don't get freaked out on the ground just to have something to solve that th those 80 percent of the, the assaults that don't aren't going to let you use a gun. Um, obviously, some kind of uh, stop the bleed thing would be useful here. And again, it kind of depends on um, who you are and what you're going to do. Uh, there are some very simple stop the bleed classes out there uh, and you can kind of you know, really, really march up the hierarchy of medical training, again, depending on what you want to do, what you're willing to haul around, you know, how much trouble you're willing to get yourself into. So we've got empty hands, we've got some medical, we've got some firearms. Um, well, I haven't said carving classes yet, have I, for some reason. Um, let me think. Uh, <laughs> and I would say probably the next big part of that would probably be some kind of a force on force exercise. Uh, the only caveat I'd throw there is that the hardest thing right now to get is decent, respectable force on force training. Uh, there's certain things I will only recommend um, that I personally attended. And, you know, for instance, there was this great guy in Georgia that used to do this incredible thing called the test, which was basically a mini NTI that was Dave Blinder of personal defense training for those of us who have been around a little bit. I mean, his, his, the test was a great force on force. The only other person that I think I can personally point to that I would send somebody to that I cared about for uh, force on force would be Carl Wren. Um, you know, there's been some recent tragedies with a guy, you know, the, the off duty police officer who was crippled 
by very, very poorly performed force on force. You know, my, my right with force on force is not necessarily that most people are unsafe per se, but most people don't know how to run the scenarios in a way to get you the learning experiences. They put you in, in crazy scenarios, that sort of a thing. So again, force on force would be a big component part of that, right? But finding good force on force is just really, really hard to do. Uh, the other thing I threw out there, you know, I was throwing out uh, pistol courses. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dave Spaulding. Again, as a really, really good uh, basic pistol course to get you up to speed and get those basic skills burned in. Um, so at this point, we've got a really, really good foundation. And, you know, you got to be thinking kind of about, you know, what we need to do from there. Um, I love, for the record, you know, I made fun of carbine classes, uh, but I love carbines. I've taken a bunch of training. Um, I do some really good work with a carbine. But for a lot of people, the, the, the cool guy stuff is going to come in really later on. And I would also offer, uh, maybe as a, a bit of self-promotion, how somebody in a mil coming from a military context decides to, to run and use that rifle is probably going to look a lot different than you when the door kicks in at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're standing there in your boxers with an AR. That's a fundamentally different situation. Uh, it's not like we're kicking doors in Fallujah. So, you know, some of that other stuff, it, it would be good. Um, you know, and again, depending on kind of the world you're running in, are you law enforcement guy? Uh, if you're, uh, the other thing I would say is that besides force on force, the, uh, the other big thing that most people don't get is we need to make you think with the gun in your hand. And the best thing I have seen readily accessible for making you think with the gun in your hand is a uh, tactics class that involves live fire. So while I haven't done it, I know the guys, they'd be great. The shootout, some of the shoot house classes. If you can find a shoot house class run by a competent, safe person, which again, not everyone is, that really makes you think with the gun in your hand. Uh, I've done Will Petty's vehicle CQB instructor program. I've taught it to my folks at work, and it is a world changer because for most of us, we don't move around other people uh, with loaded guns. But what do we expect people to do in the real world? Well, just that thing. And that's one of my caveats is if you expect people to do it in the real world, you probably need to train it to do it. So just getting people used to moving around, the, the tactics associated with that. And again, thinking with the gun in your hand under, I guess, obviously high consequences would be the most polite way to say that, would be really, really invaluable as well. And then again, you've got to go back and refresh that stuff. And if we look at the learning model, one of the most useful things, uh, not to, to shamelessly plug Lee Weems or you or anybody else, but regular review by a skilled coach is a really important part of developing those skills because we all deliver slop in our technique. Akil, I've heard that some people, when they're working their emergency reloads, will start to let that gun sink. Really, really low. <laughs> and if somebody that has a gun, point that out to them, they can like a whole second on their casino drill. And do really well on their casino drill. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, if you would like to take a few minutes to shamelessly plug a kill on myself, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you know, uh, not to, you know, I was really happy, you know, Lee came and did a, I hosted Lee for a class and he does some stuff with muzzle control drills. You know, I don't want to give everything away, but again, it's, a, it's probably a lesser shade of that, you know, making you think with the gun in your hand, worrying about muzzle control. Um, and I'd say, uh, just to, to, since you asked, I'm going to keep talking to you. I think that sometimes as instructors that we start at the wrong point. The, the example I'd use of this is that whenever I run a carving class, I used to, you know, there's always a point of contention about people, about muzzle direction, and, well, I don't need my safety on, all this other kind of stuff. Well, whenever I teach a carving class now, the first thing we do is we clear out the guns, and we start to move around each other as students. And as soon as you realize the context under which you're going to employ those skills, all of a sudden, nobody wants to argue about where the safety is, because if you're the person that's standing there as the other guy moves past you, guess what position you want that safety in, right? Yes, sir. Guess where you want that muzzle direction. So, again, um, making people think about the mundane stuff in a meaningful way, I think, is something that we really, really need to do. And as much as it pains me to admit it, Lee does an acceptable <laughs> job of that most of the time. <laughs> I like that. Acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that's the that's that's the highest praise I'm going to get out of him. So uh, <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, Ryan McCann uh, had a question in the live chat that really lends itself well to where we are in the conversation right now. And I know what the answer to this question better be because it's one of the things I incorporate in my classes. Oh, before we go any further, is that the, the Ryan McCann that I shot against? 
at TechCon this year? Yes. Right? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and, and you won that, Ryan? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, he's going to spank me next time. I can see that coming. Yeah. He's working hard. Okay. Um, do you think it's important to incorporate uh, a draw to the ready without firing in your dry work and in your live fire work uh, so that you're not hardwiring your brain uh, to draw and fire the pistol every time you pull the pistol out of the holster? Yeah, absolutely. My take on that is anytime I need to incorporate, you know, the, my fancy schmancy where it would be a branching decision, right? So when I start to draw the gun, I either need to shoot or not shoot. So that decision is a branch in my, how I'm going to respond. So anytime that you're, you're training something that requires a branching decision, I don't want to do it just that one branch all of the time. And I would even go so further that if you're going to simply draw the gun to the ready, get yourself used to issuing a clear, simple verbal command like screaming stop really loud, you know, assuming you, you know, you're not going to freak out friends, family, stuff like that. So, yeah, drawing the gun and not shooting all the time is, is really important. And it's one, again, of those uh, um, less seen, often neglected, but important skills. Cool. Uh, I think I need to check my phones and see if I still have a video of you running the Blue Falcon drill. Because uh, I, I do, I know there was video is, uh, proof of that at one point in time. I just don't know if it still exists. Oh, dude, that, that, like I said, it was it was mind opening to have to. Again, it's uh, I, you know, it goes back to task complexity. Uh, it's a fundamental different thing. The task complexity of you know delivering a build drill under a smoking time versus you know maneuvering around shoots, no shoots, uh, delivering you know body shots to some, head shots to other. Again, task complexity is something that we need to address. We probably don't want to throw people in the deep end of the pool. But on the other hand, you're not going to help them out by letting them stay in the shallow pool all the time. Shallow okay. end of the pool, sorry. Uh, another question from Ryan. Uh, do you think uh, hunting uh, has a bit positive benefit to your firearms training as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's a slide in my presentation. Uh, what everybody goes out there and tries to do is, you know, find the one perfect analog to do well in a gunfight. So, you know, people simply will say, oh, my God, you got to shoot competition. Other people are like, oh, my God, competition will get you killed in the streets. There's training. There's force on force. There's all these things that we can do. And my, my take on it is this, is that almost everything has some benefit. Some things may have more benefit than others, but very few things have negative value. For instance, one of the few things of negative value is knowing you have problems and ignoring them and keep working. You know, I think one of the most horrible things I've seen in law enforcement is somebody's trying to shoot a plate rack and they're not hitting and they eventually figure out the hold, the hold for the plate rack. Because what they're having to do is hold the gun up and to the right <laughs> enough so that when they land on the trigger, the bullet drops down, right? That's getting the hold on the plate rack. Well, that's just a long series of floating brain trigger presses, right? So obviously... Lee, you're laughing. You've seen this, haven't you? <laughs> uh, I, I may have told a captain at one point in time that he needed to carry a bucket around with him so that if he got into a shooting encounter, he needed to put his bucket down to the to the right of the person and jump on it before he started shooting so that the rounds would yeah. – he didn't, he didn't appreciate that. Thankfully, I was <laughs> thankfully I was chief when I told him that, not a sergeant. That, that's, a good, that's a good way to be. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, obviously letting known mistakes um, – go uncorrected is negative. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, physical fitness, you should be in the best shape that uh, you can be. Um, and that, again, I would say that's more of a thing for military and law enforcement. If you're going to, if you're going to have to deliver skill um, after, you know, some kind of duress, whether it's a fight with somebody or a foot chase or just, you know, a really good car chase, something like that, then the physical fitness, not maintaining that is a negative, but I just can't think of much else that's negative. So even if you just something as simply as going out and plinking 10 cans with a 22, that's not high combat training, but you're at least getting your uh, your mind wrapped around the gun going off. You know, shooting well is kind of a very unnatural act. So just practicing that unnatural act, even in a very casual format, has value. So going up and, you know, we think about sliding up this scale of value. Uh, that's where we find competition. Um, I don't care what you shoot. I would offer that you probably need to shoot everything if you can. So steel challenge, uh, IPSC, IDPA, all that kind of stuff. Go out and shoot some of that, especially where you don't have control over what's going on in the fight or going on in the scenarios. Uh, moving up from there, uh, the next big jump up, and I think it's huge and it's hard to find, is man on man. I think most people that have done that kind of stuff or people who haven't done that do not appreciate the amount of stress that it puts on somebody, especially when you're doing it in front of a crowd. 
but it's kind of the essence of what we're trying to do. Again, channeling my inner Tom Givens, it's a great way to learn to ignore external stimuli over which you have no control. If you're in a man on man shooting contest and you're worrying about what the guy next to you is doing, you're not worrying about your sights and trigger, which are really the only thing that's going to get you out of there. So again, man on man competition, really good. Uh, value wise, I bump up there, you know, force on force. And after about this point is where we start to get into see the value of hunting. And again, I would say not all hunting is created equal. Uh, if you, uh, you know, again, snipe Bambi at 300 yards, I'm impressed with your marksmanship, but it's not the same thing as perhaps uh, stalking in on a 350 pound boar hog with your service pistol and shooting it that way. Those, those are fundamentally <laughs> different experiences. Um, this is a time for a story. Uh, I, I used to be very heavily involved in our field training. Uh, one of the guys that I came with you sometimes get these guys that work for other agencies. They have a ton of experience. And this guy uh, had spent a tremendous amount of uh, time in the Army Reserve uh, doing helicopter crew chief work. His unit gets sent over there. And apparently somebody was looking for people that had a lot of hours flying under night visions. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, you're going to come with us and you're going to fly with us for your time while you're over here. Well, us was the 160th SOAR, which is kind of the special operations helicopters guys. And they managed to get him into a bunch of uh, nasty situations. He said he'd sit there, he, he could tell you what it sounds like when 50 cal is pinging off the bottom of a black hawk, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a guy that had been in fights, had been shot at and shot back. Well, I take him out there, there's a, a hog. We spend some time on a stalk because, again, that, all that's kind of anticipation that makes you simmer. Uh, he finally stalks in on the hog, lines everything up, and it was, it was beautiful. He presses off this shot, and he was like somebody – cut the strings on a puppet. The, the hog just drops right there. And we walk up and man, he's, you know, shot that hog right behind the ear. And I'm like, man, that was an incredible shot. And it was at this point, he made a really serious mistake, which was, yeah, I was trying to shoot her in the heart and I kind of shanked that one to the left. And I'm like, dude, if you had not told me, I would not have known better. <laughs> right. So the next day I'm talking to him about it. I'm like, okay, man, you've been in combat. You've been shot at multiple times. You've shot back. On a scale of one to ten, what was that hog stock like? He's like, dude, that was an eight point five. Okay, so I would offer this: is if you can get an eight point five out there without getting shot at yourself, that's probably about as close as we can hope to get uh, as far as preparation for the kind of encounters we're talking about. Nice. So again, you kind of touched on something earlier. Um, when you were talking about, you know, preparing those mental maps and stuff, um, can you discuss the battle, the kind of the battle between the, um, the rational mind and the emotional mind and uh, kind of what you can do to prepare the rational mind to win out? Okay. In, uh, in, in 30 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the so, tough time. <laughs> so that's kind of, one of the I would call it the, one of the central points of my topic or, or, or my big talk is you uh, for people that don't know you it's easier to conceive and it's not perfect but a really good way to think about the human mind is that you have two minds competing for the same space and for some of us that's a lot of empty space that they can compete for right but uh, you have kind of the classic emotional mind this is the where we hear about body alarm reaction it's where fight or flight exists it's a very primitive part of the brain that can really only perform a few things well. You know, that's fight, flight, freeze, fornicate. It's kind of those four Fs, right? It's very limited in its repertoire. Well, I would point out that, number one, those are time-tested strategies, so they're not always bad. They're not always stupid, you know? Uh, we freeze. We tend to freeze because we grew up uh, ancestrally in a world filled with large critters that wanted to eat us that were all psych hunters. So while maybe in the middle of an active shooter event, freezing may not be the best thing to do. Freezing is a time tested strategy that your mind is not afraid to default to. On the other side of the brain, we have the what we think of if we want to talk brain terminology, the rational part of the mind, the stuff that exists in the neocortex. This is where all of our thinking comes from. This is our language skills. This is our ability to create and build. Um, and the real struggle ultimately we're talking about is which of those two minds is controlling the fight. You know, I think of kind of your subconscious as kind of like this crusty old baseball coach, right? And he's always sitting there trying to figure out when to put the pinch hitter in, right? And as long as things are going pretty good, that crusty old coach has no problems leaving the rational mind in charge. However, 
as soon as existence is threatened or damage to the ego is present, then all of a sudden the emotional mind starts to become a lot more appealing. And I mentioned damage to the ego because this is why competition is so valuable. Because while your life is not at risk, right, in the middle of a shooting competition or something like that, your ego is at risk. And the subconscious really doesn't put much recognition or differentiation between the two of those, right? But uh, moving on here, uh, anytime uh, we're worried about staying in control, that coach is trying to figure out who to put in, in the game. I think of the uh, the emotional mind as a great big old mean, nasty grizzly bear. You know, he can't do much. He can't problem solve. But if it involves tearing things up or running away really fast, well, that's a really good solution if those are good things. The problem is all of the problems we are trying to solve that we're discussing here tonight are problems that can really only be solved by the rational mind. If you think about an unfolding encounter, not only do we have the application of skill and tactics, but, you know, it would really stink to go, go do all the right things, deliver the skills, and then not take into con not take into your factors the legal consequences of what you're doing and end up going to prison, right? So everything that we need to do, everything we're talking about, requires that we be able to engage the rational mind while we're under stress. Um, and again, in the world we live in, a lot of times trying to implement the uh, the emotional mind um, just gets us killed. You know, the classic example of that is a lot of guys that die scuba diving die with air in the tanks. They do. They've got a way to save themselves. The problem is when something starts to go wrong with the regulator or something like that, the emotional part of their mind is like, oh, no, we can't breathe. And we had this thing in our mouth. Let's pull it out. And everybody that has pulled it out right of the mouth, we end up, you know, we find them in 100 foot of water with air in their tanks because they're trying to solve a problem that can only be solved with the rational mind using the emotional mind. So that's kind of that really big struggle. When I talk about emotional control on that that uh, seesaw, that's what I'm talking about is mm -hmm. keeping the rational mind, uh, I guess, large and in charge would be one way to say it. Because, again, everything that we're going to be doing is going to have to, uh, the things we need to do, whether it's deciding when to deploy a skill, when to, to move tactically, do something like that, all that relies on the rational mind. And the way to get better at that is to simply put yourself in high-stress situations where the rational mind is the only way to keep you alive. Uh, one of the ways we can see this, if we look at selection for very high-end military units, right? Um, first off, um, those people are probably not like us. There are some genetic predispositions to some of this stuff that we can't uh, overrule, but we can certainly influence, right? And a lot of the guys that you see going into those very elite military units, their idea of what is and is not dangerous is just gonna be different for most of us. But for instance, uh, my understanding is this, is that uh, when uh, the army unit that we, most people refer to as Delta Force, whatever it was, when that was initially formed, you had a large pool of Vietnam vets that you could pull from. And one of the criteria to get into the unit at the time was that somebody in the unit had to vouch that they had stood beside you and you had fought, which if you think about it, is a hell of a vouching system. You know, you know that guy's going to be on, on the job. The problem was, is they began to lose that pool of you know combat people. They had to find other ways to do it, right? So they brought in the psychologist. They started to look. And interestingly enough, they, they identified three different recreational activities that were highly, highly predictive of your success in those high-end military units. Those were uh, rock climbing, motorcycle racing, and skydiving, okay? So first off, in every one of those situations, you if you screw up, there is a good chance or an absolute chance you will die. You know, I think it's a fundamentally different perspective between racing a motorcycle, right, in which you're kind of sitting out there with no protection around you versus, say, racing a car. But all those exercises are going to require that your rational mind stay in control and that you also perform some fine motor skills while under the, the, the penalty of death if you don't do them right. So, again, um, anything that you can expose your mind to that makes it kind of the rational mind stay in control is going to help you out. And that can be everything from you know, shooting competition to uh, you know, being a volunteer EMS person. I, I have some background in that and <coughs> arriving, being the first person on scene of a, you know, a multiple car MVC where you've got bodies strewn everywhere is a little stressful. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about, but learning to function, any, I would say everybody wants like this perfect one-to-one -one analog, but basically everything that you do that makes your body learn to accept and deal with stress, is going to help you in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And that big thing we're trying to do is to keep that rational mind in charge. Nice. Good stuff. All right, John. Um, you're the first person I ever heard use the term pro-social violence. I don't know if you coined it. You know, 
Yes. Yes. I can claim so little, but let me proclaim right here that I actually coined the term pro-social violence. That was that that is entirely my baby. All right, cool. So opportunity. What is it? Why is it important? And do you think that the need is being addressed in the training community currently? Well, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know how you get put on a team and you've got some really good players and you've got some horrible slackers that you're going to have to drag along. I got put on that team, right? And uh, it was pretty much me and Tiffany had to save the world. This is how <laughs> I remember events. Um, but you know, one of the fundamental assumptions that we make in this world is that when we do violence to others, it's okay, which is a really different take, at least as far as contemporary take on violence. So the way we typically define pro-social violence is lawful moral violence in the service of good, okay? That if you allow bad people to go out and continue to do bad things to people, that is not a net social good. That sometimes the answer to our societal problems is lawful moral violence. In fact, it's probably the only answer. Uh, in a lot of situations. So pro, coining pro-social violence was my attempt to kind of um, override the common narrative that all violence is bad. You know, if I'm being held hostage, you know, and somebody's got a gun to my head, uh, I, I'm going to think it's a really good positive social if somebody would put 168 brain match 308 through that guy's medulla. I, I would I would probably appreciate that and call that a net good. So, you know, pro-social violence is just a contraposition to the to the idea that all violence is bad. That as long as it's grounded in a moral and proper legal framework, then violence can be a, a pro-social good. It can make our society better. Cool. Do you think that it's being addressed in the training community currently? I mean, being taught, you know. Man, I don't know. Um, part of that kind of falls into um, the mindset stuff. Um, I would say that uh, certain people do it better than others. Again, you know, uh, he's probably watching this and it pains me to say this, but I have a lot of respect for Tom Gibbons, right? <laughs> he is uh, one of the things that he does better than anybody else is give his students permission to save themselves and others. And because there's so much societal programming around this topic, you almost have to have an authoritative figure tell you that it's okay. You know, we get wrapped up in the, you know, not to you know, talk about Grossman too much unless you want to, but we, we have all these misconceptions about violence and the way everything unfolds. And sometimes you need somebody to say, yeah, it's unfortunate that you had to kill that dude, but you know, there weren't a lot of other options. Uh, the best take on this I think I've ever heard actually comes from one of the greatest living Americans right now, Dr. Thomas Sowell. And basically he said, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. I think that's kind of my take on pro-social violence is that, uh, maybe me having to kill somebody to keep my, myself and loved ones alive. That's not an ideal, perfect solution. But when I sit there and I weigh all the other trade-offs at hand, man, I, I, I have people that rely on me, um, you know, that, you know, some of them claim to even love me. I know that's hard to believe, right? But you know, I have people to come home to and I need to take care of. So if you put yourself between me and them, uh, I'm going to do my best to make sure it goes in my favor. Okay, since, since you mentioned this team that, that you were placed <laughs> upon, um, I, I, Tim Reedy wants to know, are you actually going to show up and present this year at the Range Master Instructor Reunion instead of milking this whole I'm having twins thing and, and, and play that off so that other people will have to do your work? Thank goodness we tagged a kill in to, to pick up your slack. <laughs> yeah, I, we're going to see how it goes. Uh, life is good. You know, there is, I mean, for no other reason than knowing Tim's there, his kilt, I will do my absolute best to be there because that's one of the things I live for. So I'm not making any promises at this point, but I'll see what I can do. Okay. He also wants to know what your uh, topics at the tactical conference will be this year. Uh, this year, the TACCON in da North Dallas TACCON is my plan is to run the whole eight hour talk again. I try to not do that every year. I try to do it every other year. So my plan is uh, for the Dallas TACCON to run, I would call it a slightly updated, like we've seen it before. There's some stuff I've added that's not really earth shaking. It, the, the same gist of that's there, but you know, um, I will say this in my I mean, in my defense, uh, that when Gabe White was asked what was the thing that he regretted most about the last TACCON we did in Little Rock was that he, was that, uh, he missed part of my talk. He caught most of it. 
So, you know, if, if Gabe's willing to say it was a big part and it was good, I have to take Gabe's word for it. Okay, cool. So I, I'm guessing that there will be a corduroy jacket with uh, patches on the sleeves for that presentation. You, you got to dress to impress. If, if you, you, know, you got to dress <laughs> for the job you want. Okay, cool. Alan? Okay. Alan, I think you're muted. Muted, muted Alan. Yes, I was. I was practicing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good answer. So, uh, hey, Alan, so, before you go, uh, let me point this out: is that you could not be joking because, like, one of these people are like, "Hey, I don't have time for all these dry presses and practice and stuff like that, dude." Everybody, I don't care what kind of a stodgy office work you go, you go to the bathroom. Okay, a lot of this is about developing motor programs. So, if when you're in the bathroom and you're in the the stall where nobody can see you, just simply working a couple of air gun draw strokes. Work some reloads, dude. Squeeze that work in wherever you can. So I'm sure that's what you were doing while you were you're muted there. We appreciate that. But yeah. man, squeeze the work in wherever you can. It all helps. Definitely. So uh, Lee, what do you got going on? Where can people get hold of you? Um, I've got the next class I've got coming up is uh, my one day defensive pistol skills class. This is at a new facility that recently opened up in the extreme North Georgia area it's up in the dalton chatsworth area which is kind of chattanooga tennessee area uh, in cisco georgia you can find that on my webpage at firstpersonsafety.com uh, and then uh, february 29th i will be it's your only chance the next four years to train on leap day um, <laughs> i will be in murfreesboro tennessee with our co-host here tonight akil kadir and tiffany uh, teaching my critical pistol skills class uh, during the day and then my standing your ground lecture that evening um, coming up in March I've got my two-day applied pistol craft course scheduled at uh, uh, the Mead Hall range in Shawnee Oklahoma, excuse me McLeod Oklahoma uh, tactical conference and the end of March I'm teaching a revolver block and my standing your ground lecture May is another applied pistol skills in Crum, Texas, and I just had a uh, contact last night uh, about doing a course in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, sometime in the spring, and I'm working on a couple of other things. Uh, so it's really starting to take off. And uh, thank you for dropping by Sunday as I was in Virginia for the debut of Applied Pistol Craft uh, at John Murphy's Place. Yes, if I hadn't had a daggone niece with the bad manners to get married on that Saturday, I would have been there for the whole thing. You know, it's just downright rude to get married during football season as well as prime training weather. Exactly. Yeah, that's – you know what? I, now that you say prime training weather, I think that's the first time I've been to John's range when it wasn't 1,000 degrees and 98% humidity. Uh, it was the first weekend that we've had since uh, April that was not in the 90s. Wow. Yeah. It was nice. Akil. Same with you. Where you, where can uh, people get a hold of you? Uh, what do you got going on? Uh, Citizensafety.com. We got all kinds of good stuff. I'm bringing Lee next year, which is going to be cool. And doing some traveling here and there. And uh, you know, locally, we're going to do some. We do a lot of NRA stuff. You know, entry level gateway stuff. You know, so um, we're going into the slow season now. But soon I'll be posting because it's cold. We'll be posting some stuff up really soon. So keep an eye out on that. Um, and then next year, I intend to bring a lot more of my mentors and, and a lot of the guys that I like to train with. Um, Brian Hill's coming next year. Like I said, Lee's coming next year. And see if I can talk John to come here. John did a really good uh, carving class for us one time. Uh, I'm trying to get him to come out. So um, citizensafety.com, check us out. Cool. John, where can people get a hold of you? What do you got going on? Anything you want to let anybody know about? All right, so uh, let's not forget our TAC cons. And Lee's already mentioned that the uh, the main TAC con will be in Dallas, Texas this year, March 27th, 28th, 29th. Um, I will be there doing my uh, eight hour talk on human performance under stress and uh, helping make sure the match runs smoothly. And let's not forget uh, that the Northwest TAC con, right there, conveniently located between Seattle and Portland, all those people that complain you're too far away, uh, why don't you do it someplace closer? Well, that's someplace closer, right? So we'll be out there July 24th, 25th, and 26th uh, at Marty Hayes' Firearms Academy of Seattle. 
offering TechCon uh, Northwest out there. And I am very pleased to announce um, that it looks like uh, if you live in the North Mississippi area, uh, I'm based out of Tupelo. Uh, I'm actually going to be hosted. We have a, a nice indoor range that's now open, uh, Trigger Time Indoor Shooting Center. Uh, he's going to be hosting me for two handgun classes. Uh, we've got the date set on November 9th and November 30th. Uh, I'm going to be teaching just a solid one day um, combative pistol, defensive pistol, however you want to phrase it, uh, pistol class. Uh, you can find that information at their website as well. And uh, I also point out that all my contact information is on the Range Master website. Uh, my, uh, if you want me to come and talk, uh, lectures I deliver, stuff like that, my, uh, my resume is online. I'd be happy to help out whoever wants some training. Awesome. And now for the most dynamic minute in podcast of fornication is rapid fire too. You know how the original rapid fire went. These are just, uh, we kind of revamped it a little bit. Um, you know, quick questions. Answers are for you personally. Uh, you know what your preferences are. Um, let's get it going. Uh, is competition a good augment to defensive training? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Least favorite skill to practice? Uh, so, uh, some of the wounded shooter stuff. I mean, you can get really, you know, you've lost, you know, you've only got three fingers left on one hand. If you're non dominant <laughs> hand. Uh, again, that's some of the real petty stuff, dude. Some of that, it's just, it's just horrible. You know, it's just, I would chalk it up as, as the least favorite, some of that stuff. Biggest training myth. Uh, that you only have to take a class once and you own the skill. That training once is enough. That's the biggest myth that runs out there. Uh, striker fire double action or single action only. For uh, you. Whichever, yeah. Whichever one you shoot the best. Gotcha. Uh, appendix or strong side hip? Uh, me personally, I've carried a gun on my strong side hip since 1992. I fully recognize that appendix is a, uh, a really good carry position, especially if you're using a well-designed holster. So basically anything other than the Spencer's Keeper would probably be a really good appendix rig, right? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a gun on my strong side uh, since 1992. I still run, run strong side hip because when I reach for a gun, I reach there. <laughs> Hold on a second. We, we've got to go back to that striker fire double action or single action only question because I think the rules of the game that it has to be for you, not what yeah. you're recommending for other people, for yeah. you. And I know for years you were a, a double action single guy. And, yep. and now what are you shooting? I'm shooting the uh, gun mandated by my agency, which is a striker <laughs> fire. A soulless class <laughs> fire to be a, a striker. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes. Which one did you? Which one did you win uh, your uh, turbo pin with? That's uh, that soulless. Was, that's soulless. <laughs> that three. Well, it, it has a little bit of soul, maybe. Sometimes, the sometimes the soul is overrated and just dead dead weight. I mean, <laughs> again, are you recommending redheads or something? You know, soul. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, my duty gun is a, a Sig 320X5 right now. That's what I'm running for a duty gun. Uh, Off-duty gun is a 320. Uh, basically, I can't do anything like anybody else. It's a full-size slide on a compact frame. Uh, my old eyes like a longer sight radius, but I like the uh, compact grip because it conceals better. Cool. In the home, pistol, rifle, or shotgun? Uh, if you give me any advance notice, I'm grabbing a carbine. Uh, I can literally do surgery with that thing. I've got a ton of training. Um, I have no qualms with a pistol with a light on it for the house. Um, I like shotguns, and I used to, actually used to keep a shotgun ready to go. But when I sat there and did the math on how much respective training I've had, please don't tell Tom, but uh, my preferred uh, in the house is a, I'm going to grab an AR, and it's going to get really loud really fast. <laughs> One thing you carry every day other than your gun? Uh, generally, OC and a flashlight. And I mean, it, that flashlight comes in handy all the time. And again, OC is just that great 80% solution to most of our problems. Mm -hmm. um, red dot for irons on a pistol. Um, again, I'm still shooting iron sights as I, my eyes are getting older and stuff like that. Um, I really want to, uh, I'd say I'm definitely very dot curious. Um, I just have not had a chance to put in the work. My, 
my take on this is dot is kind of a specialty thing. I've seen people work to run them in classes. And I think it, when I go to a dot, I'm certainly going to, you know, just show up at a Jadlinski class or something like that with mm -hmm. as minimal training on it as I can. I'm like, dude, I need you to teach me how to run this thing from scratch because there's nothing worse as an instructor with trying to fight a bunch of, you know, someone's uh, uh, ingrained bad habits. So I, I have no objections to the dot. It's just, it's not an option for me on a work gun uh, yet anyway. Well, yeah, it's sure. a good thing that Jed Linsky is at TACCON. Oh, really? Are yeah. our standards that low now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Not curious. That's right, Tim Brady. <laughs> I, I have this vision of, like, Tim, Spencer, and, like, Jed Linsky just, like, pummeling me in some dark corner of Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> and Murphy, too. You know, he'll like bite my ankles or something. Every time, Sp <laughs> every time Spencer throws a punch, he'll be mentioned Langdon and Tactical Elite as he does it. Chill <laughs> <laughs> level, master. <laughs> Three books that you recommend that are must reads, and of course, they do not need to be firearms related or self defense related. All right, so I'll throw a, I'll answer this question before, but i just throw out some different answers. Um, if you're an instructor, uh, you need to know how people learn. Uh, Motor Control and Learning uh, by Schmidt and Lee is a graduate level textbook on that subject. You don't necessarily have to read the whole thing, but a lot of the mythology that I was able to counter came out of that book um, as far as teaching people skills. Another good book for instructors is, uh, his first name is Dustin, Dustin Solomon's Building Shooters. Uh, he kind of goes into a lot of the, neuro, the, the neuroscience of, of teaching shooting specifically very, very well. I throw that out there. And then um, I think that uh, I think I mentioned fighting smarter last time. So, Tom, I'm not I, I plugged it kind of sub, you know, on the side there. So, you know, fighting smarter. <laughs> but the other thing I'd point out is uh, Lawrence Gonzalez's Deep Survival. Um, absolute incredible book. I've read it through probably at least five or six times now own it digitally, own a hard print copy, that kind of a thing. So I'll go with those three tonight. Cool. Because I did mention Fighting Smarter earlier. My Tom Jones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wish there's an updated version out soon. Yeah, yeah. there should be an updated version by the end of the year. And I'm so glad. I thought he was going to basically let that book die on the vine. And I'm so glad that he's found somebody that's willing to work with him and keep it alive because it's an awesome resource. It is. So John, when are you writing your book, man? Dude, I, uh, I've got like the first part of the chapter done. I thought I was going to have all this free time staying home with the kids. And it turns out that that has not worked out that way. <laughs> there he goes again. My wife had twins. <laughs> <laughs> please recommend one peer teacher, trainer, coach, instructor, no one on the panel, please. Well, it will certainly not be Lee Wheaton. So <laughs> for you. Um, not. Uh, Somebody that didn't get enough credit that I would recommend uh, very heavily, uh, nobody talks about much anymore because he's more California, is uh, Scotty Reitz. I mean, he's one of those old school gun site trained gunfighters that have put, a, not only has he put a lot of people on the ground, but more importantly, he's taught people to do that. So I've, I've done only one class with him. Uh, one of my dreams is to get back out to, is to get to California to train with him again. So I would throw out uh, Scotty Reitz. Everybody that's taking a class with him calls him Uncle Scotty. But uh, definitely one of the underappreciated guys out there as far as training goes. Phenomenal. All right, folks. Nice. Uh, we sent out the last pre-order of T-shirts last week. So you guys should be getting those by the end of this week or next week. So please check your we uh, check your mailbox, and we appreciate you being patient. As you guys know, for those who have ordered uh, CCR shirts, we do them every uh, pre-order every quarter. And so we'll start fresh now. Um, for and so far, no one, none are in yet. So, all in November, the next ones will go out to late December, early January. Um, uh, for those who've inquired, just we're doing a pre order, it's twenty dollars, two dollar, uh, two XLs or more, five dollars. Go to our PayPal link in the show notes, paypal.me forward slash CC radio. Uh, in this, in the section for that, say the notes, please put your size and address and do a pre order. And we'll ship these out and get these out to you as soon as possible. To become a co corporate sponsor or to advertise on the show, please send an email to Brock3 at gmail.com. Please uh, give us a like. Uh, 
YouTube has completely demonetized all they don't even make any arms about it. if you've got a channel they just demonetize it so give us a like if you like it share it so that the uh, information gets out to people and, and gets to people that we want uh, check out our show notes uh, for all of our nine out of 137 podcast stations um, for iTunes iHeartRadio Spotify Google Place uh, Google Play Music Stitcher TuneIn Podbean on Speaker FM check out our Industry Partners, Eridus Industries, ATI, Battle Comp, Big Tech Outdoors, Dark Angel Medical, Dark Steer, Gar, G G G Dark Star Gear, Fire Clean, and Trident's Concepts. Please join us next Wednesday, October the 23rd, where we bring back Mr. Dr. Sherman House, owner of the Civilian uh, Defender. He's over there, I think, in Akil's neck of the woods over in uh, Tennessee somewhere. Uh, behind that, we have uh, Caleb Causey, Todd Fossey, founder, chief instructor of Integrative uh, Defensive Straight at Strategies. And then we have Beth Walker, three Beth Gun, and then Jonathan and Geneva Solomon, owners of Redstone Firearms out in California. We're stoked to have them. They've already mentioned uh, TACCOM, but I'm going to mention again, registration is open for TACCOM 2020. The location is Dada Dallas Pistol uh club in Carrollton, Texas, and it's in March 27th and 29th. We have the link to the Eventbrite. Alan and I will be there um, attending as students. Um, Lee will be teaching. John will be teaching. Akil, are you coming, brother? Uh, yes, I'll be there. All right, fantastic. I think I'm teaching, I think I'm teaching too. Okay, well, He's there we go. First in this matter, he's showing up. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I'm really, all right, so, so yeah, I'll be there. Out, Man. out somewhere, out on the uh, range somewhere. All right, cool. Well, we're yeah. we're we're excited about seeing you. And then our other co-host who's off tonight, uh, Tatiana, will be uh, presenting there. Um, and let me see. Me and Alan are going to be attending Elite Shooting Sports Customer Appreciation Day. Uh, we were invited by. Um, our, our good friend and the best armor in Northern Virginia, Rob Jensen, will be there on Saturday, November 2nd, all day. So please come out and hang out with us and chill, and uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, so let's go from here to final thoughts to Alan. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, Lee and Akil for, for giving their time up today. And, of course, John, uh, I, I love I, lo I like the analytical stuff. Stuff. I, li I like uh, when we talk about all this other stuff aside from shooting sometimes. Um, and then I really want to thank all the people that tune in for the chat and take that time out and ask questions and, and participate. It, uh, it, it, it really feels good to have you guys to hear and, and, and uh, you know, joining in the conversation. Really appreciate it. All right. Fantastic. Akil, final thoughts, brother. Um, yeah, well, I'm a big fan of John's work and, and, uh, even back, I remember back when the TACCON, when he was developing it, it was, I was like, there's a lot to it. Um, and his book, Armed Defense, if you can go get it, it's a great read. I was just looking today and realizing I had highlighted almost the whole 5,000 words, but good stuff. And I think, thanks for Brock for having me on. That's our pleasure, man. We love having and you me. too, Alan. And Lee Williams. And Final thoughts, brother. So there I was, as all great stories begin, uh, landed at the Tampa airport and I, I get off and, and, I'm, <laughs> and, and, and I'm making my way out to the appointed spot to where my, my ride is supposed to be picking me up. And there he is standing there with a little chauffeur's cap on, white gloves, and a sign says, am I being detained? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, there to pick me up. Yeah, that's what I uh, take off from my police citizen contact scores. But, uh, John, I appreciate, uh, you know, everybody else sees the intellectual stuff that you put out, and, and, I, and they all think you're smart for some reason. Um, <laughs> I personally enjoy the uh, uh, the behind the scenes discussions and the deep dives into the uh, the uh, the topics that that we all find all the people in the show find interesting and the all the many nights hanging out at Tom and Lynn's house with the family we actually like to be around. Uh, you know, you're the you're the older brother that I actually kind of like. 
<laughs> so uh, uh, thank you for that. And just on a, a parting shot for the, the class that was in Virginia this week, that was my debut of my two day traveling road show. I really appreciated them. And we, you know, we had a, a gamut from very experienced shooters uh, to uh, some, some newer people. And uh, there was one gentleman that showed up uh, whose gear was not uh, optimal. Uh, from what we would see, but man, this guy's attitude was absolutely perfect. He Great, was dude. teachable, uh, very enthusiastic, and um, uh, you know, we we pulled him aside and talked to him a little bit. You're like, look, the shooting in this class may be a little over your head, but you're doing well. And what's most important is your attitude, uh, is that you're 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 teachable, and um, he's hooked. He's now one of the community. He'll Sweet. be back. He'll be taking classes from Murphy and from uh, Tim Chandler there at Justin yes. his concepts right. and stuff. And so, you know, congrat congratulations. We've got a guy uh, that's going to be joining, you know, joining our, our, our walk of life there. And it's just so fun to see someone with that attitude and not, um, you know, well, this is the way I've been doing this since last week, so I'm not going to change it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was just, wow, I was just thoroughly impressed with, with, with his approach. Fantastic. And folks, I, as always, we leave the last final thought with uh, Mr. Hearn after I say my spiel. Um, for those who are wondering why I'm tripping my words, I've been taking Pregnizone, 60 grams, milligrams of Pregnizone, and this stuff is no joke powerful. It like muddled me to the point where I can talk for like a day. One of the um, side of effects of it is so you can't having um, trouble thinking, speaking, and walking, and it hit me all three. Like last week, I couldn't even do it. So I apologize for not the uh, the lack of fluidity and uh, I'm working through it and getting back uh, on my feet. So just wanted to tell you guys, thank you as always for being here with us and being patient and I will pass the, oh, by the way, Akil, um, Lynn said you are definitely teaching in the uh, chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> mom, yes, mom. <laughs> so you're, you're there, brother. So we, yes, we cleared that up. All right, John, go ahead, brother. Well, I, my, my first comment is I'm just trying to figure out how much prednisone Spencer's on, right? <laughs> it's, it's <a> lot. <laughs> but, uh, I guess on a more serious note, we talked about doing the work. Uh, you know, realistically, we're all ambassadors out there uh, trying to promote the Second Amendment. And if you're a sloppy, nasty ambassador, you don't do us any good. So I can assure you, if you go out there, you can do the work. You can do great things to protect yourselves, your loved ones. But you're also going to make sure that future generations retain that same right. So, you know, don't be a butthead. <laughs> All right. We're going to quote that directly from you, John. <laughs> don't be a butthead. All right, folks. Uh, we wanted to leave with uh, from our, our, our kilted um, who I'm not looking forward to seeing. I got to make sure I never mind. I'm not going to say that. I'll just. I'll be nice, Tim. I don't want to get jumped either along with John. So <laughs> I don't want to get black bagged when I was show up at the, at the airport. Uh, for me and what I encourage people to do is if they are going to carry is to carry an act of love. It is not because of fear or hate or anger, but we can't. We care. We carry because we love life. We love our families, and it's something worth protecting. By Tim Re Reedy from TDR, and we love that. Uh, we want to say good night to you guys, good folks. Have a great night. Stay safe. Be positive. Remain vigilant. We'll see you guys next week. God bless you. Have a good night. Thank you, folks. And we're off air.